Shall we get started? All right. We'll grab this one. All right. Uh, good morning. I hope you uh, are all excited for day three of DrupalCon. And um, I hope that I can answer this question for you today. Should you go serverless? So some topics. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. I will talk about what is serverless. It's something, it's weird. It sounds weird, right? Uh, I'll show you some example architectures. Uh, and I will explain, like, can you use Drupal with serverless? And can you run Drupal serverless? And how you can get started yourself. So first I'll introduce myself. I'm Robert. I'm uh, one of the technical directors in the Hilversum office that's close to Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, I'm a serverless enthusiast, which uh, sometimes annoys uh, my colleagues, but uh, we do a lot of uh, projects with it nowadays. For those who don't know Media Monks, we're a global digital production agency. We're eight and a half thousand uh, monks, as we call ourselves. And uh, we have offices all over the world. And we are happy to work for all the biggest brands in the world as well. So what is serverless? Does anyone know? Is anyone using it already? No one. All right. Then you're in for a treat. So serverless is a weird name, right? Um, and the creators of serverless framework, they say like, OK, at home, you're using Wi-Fi. Uh, and it's basically the same with serverless. So obviously, you're connected to Wi-Fi, but eventually, there is a wire somewhere. So just like serverless, of course, there is a server because stuff needs to be hosted. But what is it? Um, well, it, it's, it's multiple things. Uh, the first, which is really important, is there's no servers for you to manage as a developer. Uh, so you don't have to worry about uh, provisioning servers or patching servers. That's all taken care of. Um, also, second, adaptive scaling. So if it's not in use, uh, you're not paying for it. So that's the pay per use, um, which is great. So it can scale down to zero. Uh, but if you get a lot of traffic suddenly, it will automatically scale up and then serve your customers' needs. Um, so you don't pay for idle servers, which happens a lot. So your servers are constantly running. Maybe there's one visitor an hour. Maybe there's no visitor, and you're still paying for it. And that's something that serverless can solve for you. Uh, for me as a developer, it means I can focus on code. So I don't have to worry about uh, setting up all the infrastructure. Uh, I just upload some code and done. There's a lot of things you can have. Nowadays, uh, serverless as a service, so you have storage. I think most of you probably use something like S3, uh, which is also kind of a serverless tool, since you don't have to worry about how it's stored. You just upload a file, and you can just assume that it's been taken care of. Uh, you have, can have the same with queues and databases, uh, but there's also a thing called functions as a service. Um, they call this FAS, and it's super interesting. This would be uh, like the most basic example if you do this in Node.js on Amazon. Um, I'm not sure if there are any Node.js developers around here. A few? All right, cool. Um, well, the, the examples are very easy, so I assume that everyone uh, with a PHP background can, uh, can understand this. So this is basically, this is your blueprint for a serverless function. So there's no framework or such around it like Drupal. This is it. And you can invoke those functions uh, synchronously, like, for instance, an HTTP call. So um, in this example, this would be an API endpoint. You see very simple, very basic. You return a 200 OK. You can set some headers. And you can set a body. So this is the most basic, like, hello world example I can think of. Uh, there's also something uh, which you can do is asynchronous invocation. And this is really interesting because, for instance, if you write a file to an S3 bucket, could be an image, could be a video, you could maybe do processing on it. So when the file is written, you trigger this function and you can figure out like what file is this, where's the bucket, and then you can decide, like, okay, this is a, a file I need to create thumbnails for, for instance. 
Then I think a question I usually get is what, what is the difference between containers and functions? And I also took VMs into account, which is what I think most developers are using. Um, so with a, with a VM, a virtual machine, you have full control. You decide everything. You decide the OS, you decide your runtime, so if it's PHP or Node, you decide the framework, everything. It can do any type of workload since you manage it. And it's suitable for long running tasks because there's no time limit or anything. Um, the downside of, I think, a VM is that you need to maintain it. You need to make sure that you have your patches of your OS um, and of your runtime. So if there's a new version of PHP or Node, you need to upgrade it. Uh, also, VMs are usually not very portable, which I think is a major downside. Uh, and, and you usually pay for idle. So if you have it running, you're constantly paying for 24-7. Uh, containers is uh, basically the same as a VM, but it's more portable. So it's something you can develop locally and you can use the same container if you want also on production. And um, obviously this is portable, so that's great. It's nice how you can uh, use your container basically everywhere on every cloud provider or your um, local machine. Uh, the downside is still the maintenance. So if there's a PHP version upgrade, you'll need to do it yourself. And pay for idle. Um, this applies most of the time. There are solutions where also containers are run only when there's traffic, but most of the time you still pay for idle. And then on the right there's functions. They don't require maintenance because the cloud provider will take care of all the upgrades of the, of the language run, uh, runtime. So if there's a new version of PHP or Node, they will handle it for you and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and the beauty is you only pay for use, so you can, uh, with hobby projects, like side projects. All right, that's uh, quite a few. Uh, I have a lot of those too. And, and sometimes, uh, a couple of years ago, it would, um, I would just not do hobby projects because, oh yeah, I need to pay another 10 bucks a month for this project. I would forget about it and suddenly you have like five, th uh, five projects running, all costing 10 bucks a month. Um, for things that probably you don't even use. And with serverless, I can just create a function and um, if I forget about it, it doesn't cost me anything. Uh, and obviously auto scaling, it's great. Uh, it can scale, like I said, from zero to thousands uh, in seconds. And I only have to worry about the code, which is the thing I enjoy most. Uh, there are a few downsides. Um, functions are usually not great for long running functions, or long running tasks. So most cloud providers have like a time limit of, of 15 minutes for a process, which usually for this is quite enough because you pay for use. So if you are doing 15 minutes of functions, then it's getting quite expensive. Also, I think a big downside, but you can decide it for yourself, is vendor lock-in. Uh, if you build something with serverless uh, uh, functions and you use services provided by a certain cloud provider, then it's hard to move away from it. So you're locked into their ecosystem, similar to as you are probably locked into either Android or iOS. You, you've invested in what they offer and you hopefully like it. Um, it's hard to move away. To me, cloud is not some just someone else's computer. I hear that a lot. Uh, I don't think this is, this is valid. Uh, because specifically with all those serverless uh, uh, services and functions, uh, you don't have to, to worry about how it runs or on how many machines it runs or if maybe 10 machines uh, are broken at once and you don't even know about it. They just take care of everything. So some, some examples, what can you actually uh, uh, do with this? I'm a big fan of serverless framework. So all the applications that I built are built with this tool. Uh, it has a free open source version, which you can uh, download and use. It works with a lot of the large cloud providers. Personally, I have most experience with AWS. So the most examples you will see are specific to AWS. But the, the general concepts can be applied uh, basically anywhere. So the most basic example would be a static site. So you generate a site locally on a build pipeline or on your machine. 
and you just upload static HTML and static assets to a storage bucket like S3, for instance, and in front of that you have a CDN. Uh, super cheap, uh, you only again pay for use, there's no functions involved here. Um, super fast, super secure, like you cannot hack uh, a bunch of static HTML files. But if you want to introduce something like a search, uh, it's you can either do it all yourself, but you can also use uh, a service that provides this, like Algolia, which is a great service for search. I'm not sure if anyone used this. Or oh, there's quite a few. Nice. Uh, big fan of it, and um, it scales well. It's super cheap, uh, so it's a perfect addition to a static site. If you want to do something with e-commerce, you can also easily integrate uh, something like Shopify, which has great JavaScript SDKs. If, for instance, there is something you have uh, that requires backend functionality, like maybe a contact form or a sign-up page or anything, there's on most uh, cloud providers also Cloudflare and also Netlify, they offer edge functions. So you can have that tiny function and you just upload it to their server and you can have a contact form. And all the rest is still static. So this is very great and cheap solution to host websites. This is uh, a tool, an audio generator tool that we built for a client a couple of years ago. And the flow was basically that uh, as a user, you would go through a, uh, a journey and you would fill in all kinds of questions. And uh, at the end of the flow, we would generate your own customized audio file. So that would be an MP3 file. And what we did there, because this, this was going to be promoted by, uh, by uh, a top artist, I, I, I don't remember which one, but they would post it on Twitter so we could have like uh, hundreds of thousands of visitors a day. We weren't really sure. So we built this also the serverless way. And what happened is that um, whenever we trigger the form that contains all your answers, we would uh, send that to a Lambda function that would trigger the creation of an MP3 file. We measured how long that usually takes. Uh, so let's say that took like 20 seconds. And then in the website on the front end, we would keep you busy for 20 seconds. And afterwards, we would just check like, hey, does this file exist now on the bucket? And if it didn't, uh, we would just have a, like a, a loader or a spinner. And then we would try again after five seconds. And if the file is there, we would just show you your download and you could download your own customized MP3 file. And we were easil uh, easily able to do 100,000 of visitors per day with this. And we didn't have to worry about scaling at all because it was all taken care of. And also it was uh, uh, relatively cheap compared to uh, doing this with VMs. Uh, a small tool I built for uh, at home. Uh, I have a consumer line like uh, everyone else, I think. Um, so that means that I don't have a static IP, but I don't like to remember my IP, so I prefer to um, remember a VPN dot uh, my name dot NL, and I would like to connect to that VPN through the host name at all times instead of the IP. But what if my IP changes? Uh, I need to update it manually, and usually those things happen when you're abroad or somewhere and you cannot figure out your home IP anymore. So I created a really tiny script uh, that's running on my uh, my NAS, so a local uh, machine for storage, and that triggers uh, a function uh, or an HTTP endpoint every five minutes. And the Lambda function then has my home IP. I verify that against the DNS API, and if it changed, I update it. And then in five minutes, my DNS records are updated and I can uh, use my VPN again. So this is a really tiny use case, what you can do with serverless. And this cost, well, I can even use the free tier for this, but if I would actually pay for this, this would cost, cost like three cents a month, which is super cheap for uh, a nice tool that you built uh, yourself. Uh, a little bit more complex, not sure if anyone knows IDNT. They're uh, event organizers. They uh, organize events like uh, DEF CON 1, Sensation, and, uh, and Thunderdome. We did a project for them. Uh, this is super complex. I'm not going to explain uh, everything here. But basically, they had a, uh, a pr a, an identity provider as a service. And that provider was bought by one of the 
the big tech companies and they got a message like oh yeah from next year on uh, we will uh, uh, we will triple your bill so they would need to pay 200,000 uh, uh, euros a month or uh, a year for uh, having that service so they came to us like okay can we not build our own identity provider um, and make it cheaper and more flexible um, that's what we did it was their requirement funnily enough to have everything serverless because they didn't want to have maintenance and running servers so uh, they came to me asking like how can we build this so I'm not going over all the details but you can see in the middle there's lambda so that's the the functions but all the other uh, all the other elements on this page are also serverless so it doesn't require any maintenance at all um, what's nice is that this project now contains the the credentials of uh, 1.4 million people so that's everyone going to their parties uh, which is a lot of people and the most interesting is that instead of paying 200,000 euros a month uh, a year they are now paying 3k a year so that's 98% cost reduction and that's I think quite exciting that you with an architecture like this you can save yourself a lot of money and also have the benefit of scaling like for this client uh, on the background you see uh, the main stage of, uh, of one of their events and when sales ticket sales happening there are sometimes a hundred thousand people in the queue waiting to buy tickets so then the system needs to scale up from zero to uh, tons of invocations just in a few minutes and that's all arranged automatically something we also built uh, uh, two years ago for obviously for the COVID uh, pandemic there were was suddenly a need for our clients to have virtual events so we created a platform that uh, that can manage this it has all kind of interactive functionality like uh, like uh, live polling which you see on the left and chats uh, and live Q&A and such uh, with video streaming and obviously since I was involved in the project we went serverless um, again I'm not going over all the details if you are interested please find me afterwards um, but something I wanted to highlight is that there's actually I was actually cheating here since that part is not serverless and that part is not serverless because we were running um, uh, an admin tool uh, it's called Sonata it's uh, a bundle for uh, on si for Symfony framework uh, I don't think is anyone familiar with Sonata admin it's oh there's a few of you nice it's a pretty niche admin tool I would say for for Symfony uh, it's not as good looking as Drupal but it's very flexible so we do like to work with it and um, as I said that part is actually not serverless but what we were doing is we were using the uh, the CMS as a tool to control all, uh, control all the content have workflows and such and when uh, you want to um, uh, synchronize everything to production we would uh, send everything to uh, Elastic Cache Redis on the you can see that on the right side so that's where th all the API's would get their content from but what about Drupal right we are DrupalCon um, so I said that this is not serverless this part but um, that part could be Drupal so that's one way how you could combine serverless with Drupal you could use the power of Drupal to manage all the content um, send it to another database that's optimized for use for scaling like I wouldn't recommend using uh, MySQL directly with uh, with cloud functions but in this case um, we send everything to Redis and Redis is blazing fast so um, but that also brings up the question like can it be done can you can you build PHP apps serverless and it turns out yes you can there's a, a great tool called Bref uh, you can, uh, for more info, you can go to bref.sh, and they are using a feature in AWS Lambda that where you can bring your own runtime. So what they built is they built a small layer around Lambda with PHP. So that means you can run PHP functions in AWS Lambda, which is really nice. So you don't have to learn per se. You don't have to learn per se uh, Node.js or some some of the other languages that they natively support. But you can just use PHP and uh, this is something I also use uh, uh, quite often myself for the hobby projects since I, I, I like JavaScript a lot but PHP is kind of my first love so I try to stick with that 
Um, and as you can see, the example for uh, if there's a file uh, created on S3, you can also do that easily in, uh, in PHP as well. Um, but then the question, like, can you do serverless Drupal? Uh, I spent uh, a few days, or uh, I think maybe a full day on this, and, 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 and yes, it's, it is actually possible. Um, I got the, uh, the Umami uh, installation profile, and I must say it's, I'm very impressed by it. It's, uh, a lot of effort went into this. I'm not sure if anyone is here that was in involved in it, but beautiful. Uh, but this is actually running fully serverless, so it's running on AWS Lambda, and uh, it has CloudFront CDN before it, and uh, also all the assets are stored on S3. So this doesn't cost anything if there's no uh, if there's no visitors. But you can see everything is working. I can uh, use the search, and I was looking at uh, this example uh, a lot of times. I'm not sure if anyone's getting hungry, but uh, I sure am. So I think that's that's pretty cool that you can actually run Drupal fully serverless. If it's a good idea, I don't think so. It it uh <laughs> it's 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 not really optimized for something like this. And I don't think it has much to do with Drupal, but more about uh, PHP running in Lambda. And so while this was for me a nice experiment. Uh, you can experiment with it yourself and, and you might find a good use case for it, maybe for a project, but uh, I don't think it was a very good fit. Uh, also, fun, fun fact is that Aurora on the right side, that is a, a MySQL or Postgres uh, uh, compatible, you can choose, uh, database, and they also provide a serverless uh, option. And so that means that the full stack, including the database server, is fully serverless. So you can configure after how much time of in inactivity it goes uh, down, so scales to zero. And I think that is maybe the biggest problem with this solution is that your first hit uh, will take a very long time because it needs to spin up that database in the background. And sometimes on your first hit it will uh, not be able to connect because the server is not running yet. So if you really want to do this and you expect visitors uh, like other visitors than yourself, then you would need to kind of configure that you don't fully scale down to zero, which I think defeats the purpose of serverless. So, What is a better solution, I think, if you want to use Drupal? Um, it could be uh, using static site generator, and a Drupal-specific one is Tome. I'm not sure if I pronounce it correctly, uh, but this is a tool you can use to uh, build static sites with Drupal, and then the end result is, again, uh, HTML files and static assets, which you can put on uh, on a bucket, a storage bucket. Or you can obviously use it with uh, any of the other uh, major static site generators. If you want to get started uh, yourself, that's uh, not very difficult. Um, like I said, there's serverless framework, which you can go download at serverless.com. Uh, it requires a node uh, to work, but it, uh, this, this tool can deploy to all the big cloud providers. I have a preference for AWS myself, but uh, also Google Cloud is a great option. They support PHP natively, while AWS does not. Uh, I think Azure doesn't support PHP natively as well, but similar to Breath on AWS, they have their own wrappers. And Cloudflare the same. So they also created a wrapper that you can use PHP on their system. Um, so like I said, Breath, it's, it's super easy to get started. They provide all kind of examples. Uh, they also provide some examples on how to use uh, Breath with uh, Laravel and Symfony, uh, Symfony framework. And obviously as Drupal uh, uh, uses a lot of the components uh, that Symfony framework uses, which is the HTTP foundation, you can also use their tutorials for Symfony Framework with Drupal. So that's uh, something that I always try to explain others that uh, since Drupal uses a lot of the components of Symfony Framework uh, or uses a lot of specific uh, Symfony components, that means that a lot of these tutorials also apply to Drupal. 
Sometimes you need to dig a little bit deeper, but in the end, it's the same libraries. Obviously, there's mistakes you can make uh, going serverless. I think the biggest mistake is that you are going into a console of Google Cloud or AWS and you manually start clicking things together. Like, oh, I want to have a database, click. I want to have this, click. It's easy to forget. It's you usually don't have the best security best practices when you manually do things. It's hard to clean up and it's hard to duplicate your environment. So I highly recommend using infrastructure as code, which is something that serverless framework does for you. Uh, because the easy thing is you can just run serverless deploy and if you added something, the framework will take care of it. And if you want to remove your stack, you just do uh, serverless um, remove and then it will remove your stack. So that makes it very easy to spin up uh, a dev environment or if you have uh, a specific feature you want to test, you can just easily spin up that feature, test it and then bring it down again. So it, it also keeps your AWS account clean, for instance. Uh, like I said, av avoid connection-based services. So tools like, or databases like MySQL or Postgres, uh, those are awesome tools, but usually it's not the best fit for serverless. And the reason is that uh, they use connections. So they keep an open connection. And if you make a mistake in not closing the connection properly, the connection stays open on the database side. And that can cause your database server to run out of connections. And then it will just give you an error and say like, hey, there's no connections available and your site will be broken. So I would recommend going with um, more cloud native databases like uh, on AWS, like DynamoDB or uh, uh, use something like Redis. Uh, be aware of the snowball effect. This, this uh, is uh, uh, a specific serverless thing. Like I showed you the example, that you can trigger a function if you have a file uploaded. So I was playing around with that and I added the picture in my bucket. I created a resized version of it and it, it triggered again and again and again and again. And it was instantly going into thousands of functions in parallel, creating thumbnails of thumbnails. Um, luckily, uh, they detect they usually detect uh, these kinds of things, but of course I had to clean the mess and it probably um, cost me some money, I don't know. But be aware of this, that something you do asynchronously can also trigger something, can trigger either the same function or something else. So make sure you take care of using the right paths as a filter. Uh, and focus on asynchronous. So like, of, of course, an API is something synchronous, but if you, for instance, are going to build um, a resizer tool, do that kind of thing in the background. In the background, So don't do it on demand, just do it in the background. When something is created, create the thumbnail. So to answer this question, should you go serverless? Uh, I think serverless is awesome, but it's just not for every kind of project. And for Drupal projects specifically, um, I'm not too sure. Um, like I said, I think it's a great combination if you use Drupal as a static site generator. Um, but I don't think that hosting Drupal itself on Lambda is a great idea. It's There's too many downsides. It's not optimized for it. That was a lot of information, right? Um, I hope I answered the question for you if you should go serverless. Are there any questions? One question in the back. Hey. Uh, so apologies if I missed this, but um, can you talk a bit more about how you manage the infrastructure in code? Is that entirely using serverless and you keep it all checked in and, and use using deployed using version control? Yeah, that is uh, indeed all done by, for instance, by serverless framework. So that can take care of all that. You can also write your own uh, infrastructure that could be either in CloudFormation specifically for AWS or something like Terraform, which is more widely supported. But that's indeed something you put in version control uh, so that allows you to add new things to your stack in branches or, yeah. Thank you. More so questions, please. 
I can ask one myself. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so mm, you run all this in uh, AWS or other services. Is there a possibility also to host a uh, serverless mm, server? <laughs> Uh, very good question. Uh, yes, you can also, um, I didn't mention that, but you can also test this locally. There's a lot of tooling that you can test the invocations of these Lambda locally. So you don't have to per se deploy it to AWS or Google. Um, if you want to do something like this yourself, there are tools for it. I believe it's called OpenStack. And it allows you to do these things on your own server. but Personally, I'm not a big fan of it since then you're again managing your own server, which is for me defeating the purpose of going serverless because I don't want to have deal with managing servers. Okay, thanks. This is not a question, but I think uh, some CLE is one of the options when you run on AVS, you can invoke the in the local environment and then when you are ready in the local environment, then you can deploy with some CLE to AVS. How did you say that was called? Some CLE. CLI. CLI. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that we have to pay for uh, usage, right? But then there was an example that uh, where there are hundreds and thousands of users coming in and uh, logging in for the event side. Yeah. Um, and that time it scales up. So how much of the cost difference it then creates, uh, saying that you know you pay for the usage, but at that time, if let's say there are events coming up every month, and that one time there are 100,000 users waiting to check in and it scales up, so how much, how much are we saving on that then? Um, it's, it's really hard to say, it's a good question. Uh, but overall, using those peak moments is usually like an hour. So you have one hour of increased traffic and also, um, I didn't want to go into too much detail, but those Lambda functions are also reused. So when, um, like, you have cold starts and warm starts, and if the function isn't used in a while, it's called a cold start, similar to your PC. If it's turned off, you need to boot it. Um, but once your PC or your Lambda is booted, then it will process a lot quicker. And that means that multiple requests are going through the same Lambda. So that's really speed optimized. Uh, so yes, it, it, it might cost, um, I'm just saying numbers, but it might cost you a dollar to have that peak sale, but running the entire server for a full day is already more expensive than that. Um, especially in a load balanced environment because that will detect like, hey, there's multiple requests coming in. We need to scale up, that takes a while. Um, and then you're also paying for uh, more servers during that time frame. So eventually, like I said, it's they were they're only paying now 3k a year for this solution, which was measured after a year since we are running this in production for almost two years now. So it was a huge cost saver. So they do they do load testing as well at the same time. Yeah, yeah, we did a lot of load testing before. Oh. Yeah, and also uh, uh, security testing, pen testing. Yeah, since we're storing uh, a lot of uh, personal information, we need to make sure that everything is uh, safe. Oh. <laughs> uh, so these are runs on servers, and servers sometimes has big load because there are might might be other projects running. So do you see a big difference between how fast a Lambda function is? So let's say sometimes it takes two milliseconds and later takes 20 milliseconds. Or are they quite consistent in speed? It's quite consistent. And you can, again, I didn't want to go into too much detail, but you can configure um, by usage of memory. It's like you can configure how much memory each function should uh, use maximum. And that scales with the number of CPUs. So if you have something really heavy, you can also play around with those numbers. Like if I give it one gigabyte of memory, it might take, um, uh, let's say it might take two seconds. But if I uh, set it to two gigabytes of memory, it might take uh, uh, 200 milliseconds. And then while you pay more for the increased memory, it's actually a lot faster. So overall you get a faster experience and while paying less. That is like benchmarking you can do. Uh, but there's no interference between other 
um, clients or such, or other users on the, the servers. And that's the beauty, they manage all of that. It's, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, I'm gonna go with one of the online questions. Um, serverless functions can be cheap and scalable, but have you found costs for adding functionality like Algolia and Redis also adds up? Um, yeah, that's a choice you need to make. Like you can host your own Elasticsearch cluster, which is super expensive. Um, while you can also use something like Algolia, which is especially for smaller sites, a lot cheaper. Uh, we're using for the same client as the event, we're also using Algolia in, in an app, and we have several thousand searches a month, so that's not too much, and I believe they pay two cents a month for it. So for two cents a month, you cannot start your own cluster. Okay, um, you had a question? Yeah. <coughs> hey, yeah, I was just wondering, um, how are you dealing with error logging and stuff with all these little functions running around? Is mm -hmm. there centralized logging or anything? Yeah, yeah, you can log everything to CloudWatch. So you can um, just do console log, for instance, in, in Node, and it would end up in CloudWatch logs. Um, with serverless framework, also, you can monitor logs of a specific function. So that would, uh, you, can, you can monitor that on your local machine, and it would just synchronize with the actual logs. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, but also in CloudWatch, you can search in logs or uh, look into metrics and such. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Another in the back. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in <coughs> interested in the uh, the limitations of running Drupal in a serverless environment. We, we have a number of projects where uh, Drupal and Tome is a really good fit, but at the same time, we need to be able to use the Drupal admin section on a relatively you know rare basis, maybe once every six months or something like that. So the idea that you could use Drupal in a serverless Exports to Tome, you know, use CloudFront or Cloudflare. That seems like a really good fit. What what kind of limitations did you hit, and are there are there ways around them? Um, I didn't actually think of that, but that's I, li I like the idea that you can maybe only run your admin in a serverless way, and then trigger a build. Um, as far as I know, uh, like it's more for smaller type of projects, so you 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 would do that locally like for blogs and such, I think that would be a good, good solution to do locally your admin, uh, so it's not connected to the internet, and then trigger your build and update it. Uh, but if you are using this for a client, let's say, I think it could, could actually be an option. I like it. We have five more minutes, yeah, I'm gonna go wrong. Yeah, hi. Just follow up for your uh, for your question that you can spin up the a EC2 instance, deploy the Drupal there, and then when when the admin stuff is done, sh shut down the EC2. Yeah, or then use platform SH. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's also a good option to. Uh, Okay. All right. Um, if you want to help uh, building Drupal, go to the contribution rooms. And if you want to rate my session, please do. I uh, value honest feedback. And I hopefully can make uh, improvements in the future. <laughs> and uh, I want to thank you all for your attention. And if you have uh, any questions or specific projects, find me. Uh, after this. <laughs>